So I'm talking about teaching smarter, and I am from University of Connecticut, and I'm the co-director for management and engineering for manufacturing. So it is a joint program with business, and so it's accredited in uh, manufacturing engineering and engineering management. So that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three needs, a need for well-rounded engineers, the changing business needs, and the need for student engagement, and then I'm going to give you some examples of what I use for students, uh, some feedback, and then a summary. So need for well-rounded engineers. So when I think of engineers, my first job out of school was Boeing, and I think of the hangar full of mechanical engineers and designers at their desks to the end. And so that's, in my mind, the traditional engineer. So from 1985, I found this definition for modern engineering. And it's pretty small, right? We worry about resources and making them into something that's rewarding and enjoyable. And we worry about humans and adverse effects of technology on humans and the environment. And then uh, in pollution that we may create. And then, of course, we're supposed to train engineers and educate them in the value of engineering. Okay. But this is 85, and there's been a lot of change. So this is the perceived current, short, perceived current shortcomings, and it is from a conference held in 2013 on transforming undergraduate education in engineering. And so this was what industry thought were shortcomings. Young engineers aren't able to understand the boundaries they're working within. They try to solve problems without truly understanding them. And if any of you have had tests with engineers, you'll notice that they don't even always read the question before they answer it. And the other problem is that if they punch it into their computer or if it comes out of a model, it must be right. There's no sanity check whatsoever. All right, so now the core competencies that came out of this conference was the ability to apply the process of science, quantitative reasoning, modeling and simulation, the understanding of the interdisciplinary of science, and the fact that they can communicate and collaborate with other disciplines because unlike the old days at Boeing, it is not an island. You do have to talk to everybody else, and they have to understand the relationship between science and society. And earlier today, I was talking about the fact that I can't believe that mechanical engineers don't get human factors, but they design machinery that humans have to use. Perfect example. Okay. Um, and then the recommendations were that there's too much knowledge, and the National Science Foundation has said the same thing. So instead of focusing on maybe specific details, they have to... Students should understand the conceptual framework, and instead of filling them with details, and I don't know how many of you call it this, but instead of students regurgitating what you put in front of them, they need to understand it. You give them some facts as a means of illustrating, but try to make it so that they have to do quantitative work that isn't rote from what the example is you give them. And um, this was from, um, sorry the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and this is what they came up with, and you notice that the, their second bullet emphasizes what the other group did, was transform engineering education, emphasizing relevance and problem-solving approach. They, of course, go a little larger, and they want to apply engineering and technology to global issues. They're worried about the global side of things, but they also want people to understand the fact that engineering is a driver of innovation. And I don't know about your school, but my school is stressing innovation at the moment. All right, now the need for student engagement. I think most of us know this, Bloom's taxonomy. It's hard to get away from the lecture. Once you've started in lectures, they're easy, right? You go through the book, you find out what's important. Um, Audiovisual. I did a rating on my students and they said, what do you want to, how would you like things? And they said, audiovisual. So we used, I used uh, examples of lean in, in videos. And then I had them take a test and the average was 22%. Uh, so audiovisual by itself is not the way to go either. Um, but some of the others, practice by doing, teaching others, evaluating and creating, make a difference. So um, for the last two years, I've been running uh, Explore Engineering for my program. And what I've found is to get the students engaged, somehow competition really helps. 
I've got a group of about 16 kids. I get them into groups. I give them an overview of the topic. And then we get to play the game. So one of the th things that we played this summer was House of Quality. You want them to know what a house of quality is. And one of the ways to get them engaged is, what do you think it is? Anybody know what this is? What's the design? What are we designing with our house of quality? Kind of logic. Um, sorry, customer requirements. Easy to close, stays open on a hill, easy to open. Doesn't leak in rain, no road noise. Engineering characteristics. Energy needed to close, blank. Blank seal resistance, check force on level ground, energy needed to open, account, uh, water resistant. No. Stays open on a hill. It's a car door. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, the undergraduates, well, the high schoolers, did a little better. They got trunk. <laughs> but, but this way it's fun, right? You get people engaged. OK. Uh, here's the winners. Uh, next thing we have them do is writing procedures. Writing procedures is not easy. To do it right, it's got to be succinct. It's got to be in the right order. So what I do is I take the PowerPoint slide notes page, right? You've got a little square on one side. You've got this, the other side with words or place to write. And so I give them a structure such as the one shown on the right, and it's given to a group built. Now they have to create instructions for another group. When they pass it off, the group they pass off to gets that little pile of stuff and the instructions. And the way that you win is if your group, your instructions create the fastest build. So I had four teams doing this. And the complexity is the first one, everybody had a symmetrical object. The second one is asymmetric. And what you can't see from this drawing or these pictures is that on one of the yellow wheels, I think it is, you don't know where to put something, or either that or it's one of the purple pieces on the top. So it's, it's not symmetrical. It's not in the center. It's off to one side. So here's students, and they've got the directions, you can see, in front of them. And they're trying to figure out how to build it. And they're looking intent. This one, same thing. They're reading through the instructions. They've got the parts, trying to figure out how to build it. This is a group who has it built, but that asymmetric part was not specified by the other group. So they know it's almost right, but now they have to figure out what to move because the time doesn't stop until they get it right. So, so they're a little frustrated. Um, okay, another problem that I gave them was a process improvement problem. So this was something different, a little bit more complex, and I got it from a conference, a Lean Six Sigma conference. So what they were given was, they were given a layout of a medical office. They were given the process that the medical office used. They were given a spaghetti diagram showing the flow of traffic, and they were asked to look at how to improve it to take this additional load, uh, cut down on the, or increase the efficiency, and to worry about human factors. So what was interesting was I thought that they would not be very interested. But the students worked at it one day for two and a half hours, and then we gave them overnight, and they continued to work on it. But, so this team came back with a drawing. So these are high schoolers. The lowest uh, age is 16, and they go to 18. So this group worked on it overnight, and I'm not sure probably others did as well. So there they are, and they're drawing it out. So they've got to come up with two um, different things. They've got to come up a list of how they made it more efficient, et cetera, and then they've got to come up with a drawing in case they change the floor plan. So the groups are busy working. And then they presented it. And then this group won. Um, and it helps to have that. I mean, there's, I won. Um, so the, for the college students, for my 1151, which is my opening class, I have it where I present a topic, and then I, they're in teams, and then they have to discuss it, and then one by one the team puts it on the board, and then we discuss it overall. So one question that's hard for students to understand is what is innovation? 
Why do we care about it? What's the relationship between innovation and failure? What can be done to improve an organization's innovation potential? And why is innovation so hard? And so it's really interesting because they don't understand that a company wants to reduce risk and innovation is anything but its only risk. So that works out well. The students like that. Um, and then I do an engagement with process improvement problems. This year uh, was the juniors, and they get a real-world problem, which they like about. They talk to the process owner, they document it, they create and develop alternatives or options, and then they present, a, they present it to the process owner, and they either do a written or an oral presentation to class. So last year, they did projects sort of around campus, and this was on the shuttle bus service on campus. So they looked at the routes that they have on campus, and then they looked at the population density of the dorms and such there. And preserving uh, short bus times and bus elimination and based on concentration of users, and what they found was that they could get rid of four buses during the 11 peak hours, and they could save $278,000 annually if you assume a simple percentage calculation. Um, this year, we worked with a small family-owned firm. I had more students there than there were owners, or there were people in the shop, so I had 22 students. They employed 17 people. And they were to go in, and they were each given separate processes in it. So this is what one of my teams did, and they said, Here's all the solutions that we see for our area. And this is how feasible it is, which means how easy it is for you to implement. And then the impact, and then they got a score. And then, uh, right, so some have a lot of impact, some don't have a whole lot of impact. And so here's one of the transformations of the process. And they said, we can make this process leaner. We can save you approximately five minutes a cycle. And when you look at it, you say, why are you doing those steps? I mean, it's why are you se separating them out, putting them in a box to move them onto another table, take them out of the box, and hang them? No logic. Um, and so each team presented to the business owners. And I think that the company was quite happy. And it's nice for the students, uh, which I'll get into shortly. Uh, the other thing I do is a complex problem. So one of the things that's interesting is that most things we walk students through, right, step by step, and they get better. When you get to complex problems, that doesn't work. You have to try complex problems to get a feel for them. And so I give them a complex problem, and I say, this is a safe failure. You're going to fail. Just accept it. You're going to fail. So. This is my first uh, problem that I gave them. It was a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation problem, labor-saving strategies and innovations for women shareholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one important note is when I do this, I get a subject matter expert. This year, I got an economist from Ghana to, to, dis, to listen to the discussions and, and the presentations. So the solution categories that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came up with are these, right? Technologies or improved practices, distribution models, behavior change strategies, novel and low cost areas. And then there's all these requirements. And so what the students have to do is, well, I give them three weeks. They're on a team, they get three weeks, and they have to come up with a presentation of at least three areas or three items that they're going to make. Here's three designs, and they have to come up with something, uh, some sort of evaluation technique. I don't tell them what, they just have to come up with an evaluation technique and choose a final design. So they're going to present that to the subject matter expert and they're going to get a grade. Then they've got three weeks to write a report about how they're going to implement that, what it's going to take to get buy-in, what are the cultural aspects, how it's going to be sustainable. And then the last thing is that the grading is 75% of the, the group presents and they get a B. But now they've, the, the students have turned in a sheet that says, what, what percentage of work did you do? What percentage of work did everyone else do? And that's where the other 25% of their grade comes in. Um, and that's on this sheet. And that, so I don't know how many of you remember being in school and having a slacker. That's what I call them, the slacker. And everybody hates them, and they float through, and they get the grade. 
This way they don't get the grade. This way they feel the pain and they have to, they either buck up or they feel the pain. Um, so for this particular group, when they did this, I think the first group got up and they had a slide and it showed Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa. And the outside expert looks at the slide and goes, take that slide off. South Africa is not Sub-Saharan Africa. Take that slide off. One of the students takes his baseball cap, puts it on backwards, and puts his head on his desk. So he went through, I mean, he was from Ghana. So when they suggested we're going to do this type of farming, this type, everybody's been, has, how many people have worked for industry? You've worked for industry. And you know that they will chew your head off, right? You say something stupid, they will chew your head off. So students haven't had that experience. So this economist made the students feel that experience, um, which I think is a good thing. Fail often, fail early. Get a thick skin, because it's going to happen. You never have enough time. You never have enough knowledge. It's the way it is. Um, so that first time, they rushed to me after class and said, are we going to fail? Are we going to fail? Um, this time, they did this project. No, they did um, Kalama uh, mining, copper mining in, in uh, Chile. And the students were not happy to be chewed on that. They were juniors this year. They didn't understand why he said those things, why he attacked them. Um, they'll know in about two years when they go off into industry, they'll understand. But I think it's an excellent thing for students to have to look at. The, it's, it's a big picture project, right? They have to worry about scope or they have to worry about culture. So for the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, no, the women couldn't stand. It was seen as lazy. No, they couldn't have an animal bigger than something. They couldn't have an ox, for example, or a mule. It was too big. All those things have to be considered. How are you going to get buy-in? One of the groups said, we're going to uh, give money to them to get buy-in. No, you can't do that. Uh, but all those things that they haven't had to think about in your standard engineering project, and so that's why it's so good, because this is the real world. You, you have to face all these things, ugly, etc. You have to be ready for them. So I really like these projects. Yeah. Um, so this year I did this one first with my juniors, and then I followed it with the process one. They asked that in the future I reverse the order because it will be much easier for them to tackle the complex after they've done a process and have a better feel of working with someone. OK, so student feedback. Um, so for my 1151, they like the fact that they they can discuss the class, um, discuss the topic. They see what other people think, a wider range of thoughts about a project or about a, a topic that they didn't think about. So it gives them a different perspective. And the real process problems, they like them. I mean, they really like doing something where they put knowledge from different courses to use. It makes them feel useful. I mean, I didn't even get to say anything when they presented, when they, you know, there were little holes and I, I didn't say anything. They just did that last week. Um, but they went out. I mean, some teams went out at 6 o'clock in the morning because the company opened at 7 and closed at 3. Uh, talked to employees, took videos of it to understand it. Um, so they, it really motivates them. They really do like that. So in summary, you can use project to create and improve students' capabilities that they really do need. My students have to go out career ready. There's no masters. Um, using resources from the internet or conferences really help as well. So the case studies that I took were from a different conference and you don't have to create it. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the, the complex ones are incredibly hard to find if anybody's got ideas, you know, because um, you have to find a culture that they're not familiar with. Otherwise, you've taken away half their work. And while they create a heavier workload, right, you've got to create it. It's not, oh, it's an A, B, C, D sort of thing you can check. Uh, it really makes a difference for the students for their understanding and for their improvement so that they get out there and can really get their feet on the ground immediately. Any questions and references if anybody's interested? <laughs>